Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about the uh, multi-cut L-shaped method, which is an extension of the um, L-shaped algorithm, and I'm also going to use the first hour as an opportunity to review uh, the L-shaped algorithm because these two look a lot like each other, so no harm in seeing again what we uh, did last week. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by comparing the two methods and then uh, showing how they work on a specific example. Um, so, if this is a reminder on a uh, notation for a two stage uh, stochastic linear program, we can write it out in uh, extended form. We have a bunch of uh, scenarios, one to capital K. And the uncertainty is, well, each scenario has a weight uh, pk, and the uncertainty is in the objective function coefficients of the second stage variables, the right-hand sides um, of the second stage constraints, and the coefficients of x in the second stage constraints. The w is uh, invariant across scenarios, although I do think that uh, Mathieu will talk about uh, whether or not this works with a w that changes per scenario. Um, okay, so the motivation for the L-shaped method was that, um, if you recall, in your exercise sections, um, you did you, you did a you you solved the problem where you showed that if you express the right-hand side, um, if you take a linear program in standard form. And you think of it as a function of the right hand side, you've seen that this is a convex function of the right hand side. And if you haven't registered that piece of information, there's a little alarm sign mm -hmm. on that. Um, this is a very useful property, and this is basically coming up over and over in the L shape method. Um, so from from that argument, you can basically show that the value function of the two-stage stochastic program, which maps the best we can do in terms of cost performance, given we've decided x in the first stage, is a piecewise linear function of that x variable. Which means we can rewrite the full uh, optimization problem like, uh, as such, so we replace the second stage cost with this uh, theta variable. And these constraints here are doing a piecewise linear approximation of the value function in the second stage. Um, this, hopefully, is crystal clear by now. Is there anyone who feels uncomfortable with this uh, notion? We can look at it graphically for a few minutes. Looking good. Um, again, the, the second stage cost is a piecewise linear function of x. In linear programming, you can write a piecewise linear function here, uh, like such. Would, would this work for a maximization problem? No. The reason is, I mean, you can think of this graphically. If you've got a bunch of constraints like this, um, and you're <coughs> taking the uh, you're you're basically always trying to get as close to these lines uh, as possible. So your theta variable is being pushed on these lines. If you were doing a maximization, the theta variable would journey to infinity and there would be nothing to stop it. So these inequalities here, the direction of their, these inequalities matters in combination with the fact that we're doing immunization. Okay, um, now for the um, multi-cut L-shaped problem, the uh, idea is identical. And my question to you is what do you see in this slide that's any different from what there was in the, in the previous slide. The thetas values are replaced by g. Right. So, do you have, um, 
Okay, so the motivation for a formulation like this is the following. Again, for an optimization problem like uh, this uh, linear program in standard form, we have um, performance which is a uh, convex function of the right hand side, and in particular, it's piecewise linear in our case. So it's not only the case that the value function, which is the sum of the q's, is a piecewise linear function in x, but each of the q's, each of these uh, costs here, is also a piecewise linear function in x, exactly because it has this form. This uh, objective function value is a convex function of x, h minus tx. So it's also a convex function of x, in fact. And in particular, you can show it's a piecewise linear function of x. So that's, if you remember, that's how we actually showed that v was a piecewise linear function of x. We just showed that these q's individually are piecewise linear functions of x. And then when you add a bunch of things that are piecewise linear, the sum remains piecewise linear. Which means what? Each of these theta k's now plays the role of approximating the q, not the whole v anymore, but each of the q's individually. Um, and that's where these optimality cuts uh, come into play. So do you see what the difference is here with the optimality cuts in the l shape method? Do we, do we regret one cut for each uh, scenario? It's one bunch of cuts for each, yeah. for each scenario. So each of these two functions, now we see it as a different piecewise linear function of x. And each piecewise linear function of x is described by this collection of cuts here. So L of k is the index of how uh, of of uh, optimal cuts for the k q function. Okay, and we have S k functions for each of these q functions. So the way I think of these problems graphically, which helps me. Um, reason in terms of optimization and uncertainties, you're always at a point um, x and you have a value function v of x which tells you your cost to go if you do things the best way you can walking into the future. And this guy is just the sum of a bunch of uh, q functions. So these are piecewise linear in x. When you sum them up, this is piecewise linear in x. You can either choose to approximate this as a piecewise linear function of x, or go into more detail by actually looking at how each of these is a piecewise linear function of x. So I gave away an important feature of this uh, approach, which is different to the algebraic method. It's more detailed. The information in this linear program is more than it is in the algebraic method. So uh, the way you generate um, optimality cuts is uh, for the L-shaped method is the following. You have a trial x. You feed it into the second stage. You solve a bunch of second stage uh, linear programs. You get a bunch of dual multipliers for these equality constraints. And you form a matrix capital E and the vector little e by averaging uh, the, the um, left hand multiplication of the dual optimal multipliers in t and the dual optimal multipliers in h. Do you have any um, guesses as to how you would get these guys here? And again, if I can give you a um, graphical um, um, if I can refresh your memory as to what this means graphically, what we basically have here is 
a v function of x at trial point xv. And what these multipliers there do for you is they tell you for this point xv what this line uh, looks like. This line we showed has to be exactly equal to the value function at point xv and has to have, have the same slope um, also at this point. So uh, the ES plus 1 is These are basically the parameters that we uh, calculate over here. So do you have any guesses as to what these little e and capital E would be? We argued why these formulas uh, work for this approximation. We showed that if you, just using strong uh, duality for linear programs, we showed that if you use these formulas to describe this line, it's going to exactly approximate v of x at x v. So do you have any guess about how you can exactly approximate the q's? You just remove the solution? Right. So for each q function, for the kth q function, it's in fact probability of that q function times the q function is exactly equal to uh, pi transpose h minus tx. So that's the trick. That's the recipe we uh, do in multicut. Um, sorry. Okay. The q function, in fact, is the pi transpose h minus tx. So the probability times the q function is equal uh, to this line evaluated at x three. Okay, so that's the recipe for generating um, these cuts over here. It, it's looking very similar to the l shape method. Um, there, is, there, there are differences. We'll, we'll see them in uh, detail. One of them is uh, the number of optimistic cuts doesn't have to be the same for each uh, Q function. Um, so here's a graphical illustration of what the l shaped method does. We're at a point x v. We compute this line that exactly supports the value function at x v. And here's a graphical illustration of what the um, multi-cut l shaped method does. So this is uh, this probability times q function is also a piecewise linear function of x. At x v, we compute this cut over here. Now. Here's a graphical illustration that uh, Matthew set up to uh, demonstrate um, why these uh, two methods may be different. So what you're seeing here is a value function v of x, the black line, <coughs> which is the weighted sum of two piecewise linear q functions, the dashed lines. Okay. Um, if you're at a point x v, what the L-shaped method will do for you, it will compute the red line that exactly supports v at x v. Yeah. How do you think the um, um, how do you think the graphically how do you think the L-shaped method uh, the multicut L-shaped method? Which two lines will it compute at this iteration? There's two Q functions here. So it's going to take one line over here and one over here. That's different now from uh, if you add these two lines up. And so if you add these two lines, which are the ones that are generated by the multi cut L shape method up then you get something that uh, at each iteration is a piecewise linear thing. It's not just a single line anymore. So at each iteration, you're building an approximation of the V function, not by just drawing single lines, but by drawing, um, 
basically uh, line segments like this. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, but okay, so um, no, yeah, you're right. And then they're adding the objective function. Yeah, just we got both. But again, okay, I guess that at that point you get the same slope, but when you move away from x v, um, you're going to get. say that you're going to get a piecewise linear approximation at each iteration, but um, that can... I'm trying to, to illustrate, I think, graphically how um, over iterations these two pictures would look uh, different, but I'll, I'll need to come back with you with hopefully a more illustrative example. But you're absolutely right. Here, just summing up the thetas, you get basically the same line. Well, okay, suppose I generated another cut over here. Then I would be averaging. Um, let's let's try and do this. Part. So um, So, um, I guess the difference would be in this region here, in terms of how the value function looks like. So, what you're doing in the multi-cut L-shape method sorry, is summing up this function and this function as opposed to what you would be doing in the um, so how many segments does this thing have? Uh, I, I want to say three, uh, actually no, no, no yeah, four. So you have a breakpoint here, here, and here. So you have a four segment approximation in iteration two. Whereas in the L-shaped method you have a two segment approximation. So uh, you're looking at the maximum distribution of the length. You're doing the next. You're doing the next. Here, what, what did I do here? What you're asking me? Well, I, I did the piecewise linear approximation of 
the first Q function in two different points. So there I'm doing the max of two, two lines. And I also did the piecewise linear approximation of this uh, Q function in two different points. And then you're summing up the total. Right. So I, I guess the difference is better illustrated after two iterations. You get, after a second iteration, a four segment approximation, whereas with the L-shaped method, you only get two lines. You are? Sandra, are you concerned? No, no. It's okay? Um, so, there's, bottom line is there's more information coming in at each uh, iteration. What do you think is the price you're paying for the extra information? If you look at the algorithm. Is this clear? I, I see a, a French debate going on in there. <laughs> is this clear, guys? Is it okay? Uh, it's, it's Matthew, right? You got it right, so that's fine. Matthew. Is it okay, Matthew? Yes, I guess. Okay. Um, again, graphically, if you want to think about it, um, the L shape, this is already very messy, or is it not but messy when enough? When we sum up the two piecewise uh, linear approximations, we are uh, on the. We put weight as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Um, yes, I already did it in Clover because I, I, I can't see the difference between uh, the edge shapes and the root. You cannot. Okay. I have some problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, let's try and do this graphical uh, illustration again. So what the. Um, L-shaped method is going to do, so, um, let me try it. The actual value function here is going to do something like this. It's the average, um, to this figure here. Is this figure clear? Over here. So the black line is the value function, the V of X. And it's the sum of two Q functions. Q, you remember what a Q function is? After I've seen the outcome, I optimize. Each of the Q functions is this uh, dashed line here and here. So uh, what the L-shaped method would do is uh, at an iteration V, it would come here and draw the red line. Then it would move maybe over here and draw another red line. Now, my crappy figure here is trying to illustrate that. So the red is the value function, and the um, approximation of this value function generated by the L-shaped method are these two lines here. <coughs> so after two iterations, what you have is two lines approximating your value function V. Now, the multi L-shaped method um, breaks that into its pieces. So it says um, at iteration um, V, I'm going to compute two lines. One for the Q function of scenario 1, which is the yellow line. One for the uh, Q function of scenario 2, which is the white line. Then it's going to bounce to the model. Suppose it bounces to the same point as the proper L-shaped method. It's going to now compute two other lines. One over here, the yellow one, for the Q function in scenario one, and one for the Q function in scenario two. Now, here's, there's more information now over here because you're looking at each of the Q functions separately. So, the first Q function, uh, the, the, the yellow one, is approximated by its upper envelope over here. Then, the second Q function is up, approximated by its, the white envelope. And if you sum up this thing, it's a uh, four segment linear approximation, whereas the value function, the, the, the L shaped method just gives you two segments. Okay. So you're getting more information. What do you think is the price you're paying? Nothing comes for free. Um, and the best way to illustrate that is in this slide over here. 
Yeah. yeah. So if you have many scenarios, this will become pretty large, pretty fast. Um, and this is a kind of a maybe a premature question for you, but uh, I'll throw it out anyways. You, did you actually implement Lagrange relaxation algorithms? Did you implement Lagrange relaxation algorithms? Did the can you see a, um, a practical advantage of Lagrange relaxation in terms of, for example, thinking in terms of memory? Subgradient method, okay. In the subgradient method, we're only using the previous iterates to come up with new multipliers. Can this problem crash your memory? After a thousand iterations? Example. Yeah, you're building up. So um, the master at some point becomes a ball for your algorithm. It becomes enormous, especially in the multi cardinal shape. It's growing up even faster. It's growing up k times faster. Basically, in the Lagrange relaxation algorithm, at least the subgradient method, you're just storing the previous multipliers and jumping. But the number of dual multipliers doesn't increase as you go. Now if you're doing bundle methods, um, like uh, uh, Adrian is doing for a project, you can uh, run it for a week and have a gigabyte. Of... So if you're, rem if you're remembering the history of where you've been, you can, it, it's a different story. Uh, but for vanilla, the, the good thing with the vanilla subgraded method is that the number of multipliers doesn't grow. Okay, moving on. Um, ah, okay. So uh, Matthew recommended I add this slide uh, because Matthew's motivation here was that he likes to think of the theta, and actually graphically that's what I did here. Here, the th each theta k represented a different q function. So you can either do theta and the objective function, in which case you're uh, representing p times q, or you can uh, have each theta represent the q function. It's just a matter of how you decide to weight things. And you can, you can either hit the probability weight in the master problem and remove it from the optimality cuts, or the other way around. It's up to you. OK. Um, so here's the description of the two algorithms. In the L-shaped algorithm, you initialize everything. No, cut, no optimality cuts, no feasibility cuts, and uh, iteration. No automatic cuts, no visibility cuts, and uh, iteration zero. You solve the master. If you're in the first iteration and you don't have any automatic cuts yet, you don't include the theta variable in the master. And your theta zero approximation is minus infinity. If you don't have a feasible solution, you add an, a feasibility cut. And then you compute one optimal cut, and your termination criteria is if the theta v computed here is greater than or equal to the wv, which is computed in step three. Now, for the multi cut L shaped algorithm, one thing that changes um, what is the one counter that will change here? Why do we need a separate counter for each uh, scenario? Yeah? I have a question for the previous slide. Um, why do you have a sum over k? For, uh... Because it's a typo. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, changes. Okay. Uh, so the sum should go away, and it should just be, yeah. Thanks, Kasan. Because you just take the quality out from there and put it exactly. up. Okay. Exactly. Sorry for that. I'll fix it. And, but it was right in the other slide. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this should be an S of k, in fact. The index here should be a function of this actual scenario. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the mod this is the procedure in the L shaped algorithm. So, in the multi cut L shaped algorithm, we have a different counter for each. Um, for each uh, scenario. Why do you think we have a different counter for each scenario? Mm -hmm. 
this is a bit tricky question. Um, if you remember the proof of convergence of the L-shaped method, I argued that you cannot generate the same optimality cut twice if the, 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 the collection of all dual multipliers that you send back from stage two to, uh, uh, to the master um, has to change from iteration to iteration. That's how we pr prove finite, uh, num uh, finite convergence of the algorithm. The graphical explanation of that was, uh, for me, it's helpful to think of that in the following way. And again, the true function is the white one. Suppose I'm doing iterations here, I generate this cut. I go to the other end of my feasible space, I generate another cut. Now this new cut is a different bunch of dual multipliers. It has to be, right? Because it's a different line. What describes these lines are the dual multipliers. You can think of them as being the same thing. Then I find this local minimum over here in the algebraic method. I co compute a new line. Again, it's a different line. The bunch of dual multipliers has to be different. And then I land here. And here I might compute this cut or this. But before I even reach the point of computing this new cut, I'll do the comparison of theta v. So uh, theta v in uh, this iteration will be uh, this value here. And w will be this value here. So I will observe that the theta is, uh, sorry, the other way around, yeah. I will observe that the theta, what I think the value function is, is in fact, uh, okay, so the way to think of theta is what I think the value function is based on my current approximation. What I think it is, is this thing here. After I'm done with step three, I actually get to know, it's a bonus information I get, I get to know the true value. And if I compare them and they're, they're different, then I generate a new cut. Um, if I then compute this line here, in the end of the third iteration, I will find that the theta three is greater than or equal to the W3, and that's exactly my termination criterion. Why? Because, sorry, over here. Why? Because what I think the value function is, is exactly equal to the value function. That is my termination criterion. Um, so you see that I can't be getting the same cut uh, repeated from iteration to iteration. It's impossible in the L method. And in contrast, in the multicut L shape, I'm computing these cues individually. So um, I might be moving, for example, here. Um, if I land in this region here, the approximation for the yellow function. It'll be the same line, but not for the, well, actually this is not a good choice of point and this figure is getting very messy. But the, the bottom line here is that the, as you're moving in the X space, the uh, slope of each individual Q function might be the same, but if, even if one of the other Q functions changes in a new point, uh, that means you need to continue, you're not done yet. Why? That, that would have changed the 
v-function slope also in the proper L-shaped method, and you would not have terminated. But the bottom line is that you can get a repetition of the same uh, lines that approximate an individual q-function in the multi cut L-shaped method. So you need a separate counter. You're detecting if you, if you get the same uh, line, no reason to add it. So uh, you, you have a routine that detects if you're computing the same approximation at a different point, and that's why there's a different counter here. Okay, uh, so we have this different counter, and we solve the massive problem. Now we have a collection of theta 1 up to theta k uh, uh, variables. Again, if we're in the first uh, uh, iteration, or if we haven't generated yet an optimality cut for the specific Q function, we ignore the theta. Is it possible that this can happen after the first iteration of the multi cut algebra? How can you have no optimality cut yet for some scenario and have an optimality cut for another one? Can it happen in iteration one? In iteration one, we don't have optimality cuts for anybody. It starts from scratch. Suppose we start iteration one. Uh, first scenario solves. Cut. Second scenario solves. Cut. Third scenario, infeasible for uh, the second stage. We generate a feasibility cut and we go back to uh, step one with one cut for scenario one, one cut for scenario two, one optimality cut actually for scenario one, one optimality cut for scenario two, but only a feasibility cut for scenario three. So it can happen even. Um, um, it can happen that the number of optimality cuts is zero for some scenarios and not for others. Okay. Um, okay, then we check if we are uh, second stage feasible. If we are for all scenarios, we jump to step three. And here's our, um, here is our uh, optimality test. So here, instead of checking the entire value function, yes? Over here. Yes. Only one or one for each one. And do you remember? It's to answer your question. It's only one for that. It's coming from that specific scenario. And do you remember how we had these big cuts? Remember what the problem we solved looked like? It was this uh, formulation with the auxiliary uh, variables. We were minimizing the, the, the E vector here is a, a vector of ones. Minimizing the sum of auxiliary variables subject to um, Tx plus Wy equals H for that scenario. But then we also added uh, this term. So the i here is just an identity matrix. So what we're doing with these two terms here is we are giving ourselves the freedom of moving as high or as low as we want to make sure we satisfy. But these are these are data for the cave scenario, and the multipliers we get here that we then use for generating the. the feasibility cuts are scenario specific. The infeasibility arises individually from each different scenario. So, um, to answer your question, just from that scenario. Yeah? Uh, if uh, there is uh, a can we save it and continue with it? Or we have to recompute it? Um, you're saying if the specific scenario Ah, so you're saying if I, if this is fulfilled for scenario K, I'm looking good. I don't need to move away as far as that Q function is concerned. Yes. I think this is your intuition, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the value function is an average of these Q functions. Mm -hmm. So one of my Q functions 
<coughs> and let's illustrate this here. <coughs> One of my Q functions uh, could be like this. And as far as this Q function is concerned, I would like to, uh, uh, to be over here. And then another one might look like this. So these are competing in terms of which one is best for each. But what happens if the probability of this one is 10 to the minus 4, and the probability of this one is 1 minus 10 to the minus 4. Obviously, the fact that I found the local minimum of this Q function is not helping me. I, I need to verify uh, this condition for all of them. Yes. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, we have time for the example. This is the example we saw uh, last week. So we're minimizing um, the sum of y1 and y2. Um, the x is lives between 0 and 10. And basically, if it's not clear to you here, we're, we're manic, manic, minimizing the absolute value of xi minus x. Can you see why that's the case? What happens if xi minus x is positive? y2 star is 0, and y1 star makes up for the positive part, and the other way around. So this is just another way of writing, minimize the absolute value of xi minus x. We have three scenarios equally likely, 1, 2, and 4. And this here is indicating complete recourse, which means no matter what we choose in X, there is a feasible second stage uh, decision. All this is saying is that we don't need to worry about feasibility of that. Okay? So iteration one, we start from uh, zero. And the L-shaped method we saw, oh, okay, typo. You should be moving that L-shaped method. Okay, uh, the multi-cut L-shaped method generates three um, cuts here. Now, for x equals zero, it turns out that these guys have the same slope. So, if we want to draw what's going on here, we have one, two, and four. The first Q function looks like this. The second one looks like this. And the third one looks like this. So indeed, at x equals zero, they all have a slope of one, minus one. And what we're generating in the first iteration are three lines and then summing them up. So as far as this first iteration is concerned, this is just what the l shape method did as well. Iteration two, uh, we get x, we saw the master, we get x optimal at 10, three more cuts. Uh, sorry, uh, the optimal values of the thetas. And when we do the optimality check, it doesn't go through, so we generate three new cuts. And yeah, at that and at that point, they also have the same slope, which is one, three lines. And then iteration three, we get an x three of two, <coughs> the three theta values, and this turns out to be optimal. How many segments do we have? at this point of the value function. But by the beginning of iteration three, how many segments do we have? Six. Yeah. Six segments. 
so much richer information. Okay, so um, like I mentioned earlier, the and the trade-offs are that we have a heavier mass problem, but uh, it typically takes fewer iter iterations. Here we saw that it took fewer iterations. If you see the same example in the textbook for the L-shaped method, it goes through, I think, six, seven iterations until it converges. Um, does it have to always happen? The multi-cut can take more iterations. In fact, there's an example in the book, but typically it takes fewer. So the trade-offs are that we have, in the plus side, more detailed representation of the value function, but a larger mass of problem. Okay. All right. <coughs> so, um, we're going to enter now the uh, domain of multi-stage stochastic programs. So we're going to go beyond two stages and uh, look at a, a horizon of multiple stages. We are going to use plenty of the ideas that we, uh, we saw in the uh, L-shaped method. But um, there, there, are, there will be uh, certain differences and the, me the set of methods is going to be much more uh, rich. The first thing that's very important to um, understand in multi-stage stochastic programming is the role of the value function. And what comes into each, uh, um, the information that comes in, into each time stage. So the notation we're going to use here and the connection from time stage to stage to time stage will be uh, very important. Also, another important issue is how we represent uh, uncertainty. So these are uh, we're going to see some of these uh, issues today. The emphasis for this class is to understand uh, the connection uh, uh, between time stages, and the connection is done through a, a state a vector, which we'll introduce in, in a minute. Um, okay, so what does a multi-stage stochastic program with recourse look like? This is it. Don't be uh, scared by a notation because it repeats itself a lot. The first thing to notice is that we have capital H uh, time periods. Okay. Now, we are... Um, for each time period, we have a cost vector linear cost and we have empty uh, decisions to make in each uh, time period. Um, there's uncertainty in all of these uh, time periods which is indicated by the, uh, by the omegas here. And what's, uh, what we're doing is we're minimizing expected cost over the set of uh, all possible outcomes. So, in each time period, we have empty uh, linear constraints. These are the HP, are the right hand sides. The uncertainty can come in, in the cost coefficients in the right hand side, or the uh, coefficients of the linear uh, constraints of each time stage. So, uh, the, the way to think of this is the the following. Um, oh, okay. Uh, to finish up the notation, so wt indexes the, the coefficient that's multiplying um, the current uh, period decisions. So it's something with empty rows, the number of linear constraints, and empty columns, the number of decisions we're making for that period. And omega t indexes the history we've observed up to t. And this is important to distinguish from omega which is just a random outcome in our space. Um, <clears throat> now, if, a few things to clarify here. The way I think of this uh, problem graphically is the following. We have x t minus 1 coming in from the period, previous period. And we have a bunch of current period constraints that are determined by this uh, equality, set of equalities here. <coughs> so, x t minus 1 contains all the information 
I need to know about what's happened already in order to make a decision now. So, the linear equality constraints that are relevant for period T decision making are these over here. Um, you look basically for uh, the, the vector that's multiplied by W. For example, for period two, for, for period one, the vector that's multiplied by W is X1. So these are the relevant constraints for the first period. Nothing's coming in from the past. It's the beginning of time. So we don't have any TX uh, elements in this first equality constraint. Now, things become a bit more uh, complicated in uh, period two. So, in period two, we have these are as the relevant constraints. <coughs> One for uh, each scenario that can occur. So, uh, sorry, not here. I should not be indexing by one over game. And unfortunately, there will be plenty of typos I'm, I'm expecting in this uh, slide deck. So, if you catch anything that looks strange to you, point it out. It's very possibly a typo. Um, that's a combination of the fact that the notation is hairy, and also I did some improvisation that's out of the book, and I'm sure we're going to discover typos. Anyway, um, constraints for period two are these here. Now, what's different between period one and period two over here? Apart from the fact that there's a decision X1 that's coming in and affecting what I'm going to do in decision two, what else is different in terms of notation? You can look at the right hand sides, for example. Mm -hmm. Omega. So we have, after we made our decision X1, where there was no uncertainty, we had some omega occurring. So now, uh, what we decide, this X2 of omega 2 indicates that what we decide depends on what we observe. Okay? That's the setup of multi-stage uh, decision-making under uncertainty. I decide something, that takes me to a certain uh, state, and then a bunch of omegas happen. <clears throat> and then I decide again. But what I decide here is going to be very different from what I decide if I observe something different. In the meantime, okay. This is, this is the way to think of multi-stage decision making under uncertainty. I decide. I see what happens. Then I react. I see what happens. Then I react, and I'm moving forward in time. Okay. Um, now, um, so the way this is different. This period two uh, constraints are different from period one is the fact that the period one decision influences what I decide. Now, what's up with the some omegas having superscripts and some not? Let me illustrate the difference between uh, of the notation. So suppose I have a, a, a problem of decision making under uncertainty with two stages. Um, for example, I can flip a coin and get uh, heads or tails. And then I can flip it again and get heads or tails. Um, Looking at the end of time, after I've flipped it twice, what's the cardinality of the uh, uncertainty set here? Oh, four possible things could happen. Okay. Now, the notation omega superscript t is you're fixing your uh, reference point at time t. <coughs> and Omega t is a member 
of the uncertainty set that you get to observe up to time t. What's the set of outcomes that I get to observe up to time t? What's the cardinality? It's two. I get to observe heads or tails. So um, that's the difference here, basically, in uh, notation. Why, from a philosophical or causality point of view, why does x have to be a function of omega superscript t instead of a, a function of omega? Suppose I'm making bets here. So I can bet 100 euro in heads or tails. Um, what would it mean if I could make a bet here uh, and, and I made it a function of omega, but I had to make a decision in time period um, zero? So omega has four elements, heads, heads. Um, It can be heads, tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. And X is my decision in the beginning of time about whether to make a bet um, that the first flip, for example, or that the sequence of flips will be heads heads. Let's say that's the uh, that's a bet I get to make. That's a game we're gonna play. I'm gonna bet a um, hundred euro, and if it turns out that it's heads heads, I get double my money. Otherwise, I lose it. That's the that's the decision making problem and uncertainty we get to make. What would be x of heads heads in this game? Bet or not bet? Bet. X of heads, tails, and everything else would be no bet. Because if I bet, I'm going to lose my money. Is that clear? What's it? So this mapping is just saying, tell me what the outcome is until the end of time. I'm going to tell you if I'm going to bet or not. That's what x of omega means. Well, in real life, is there any point in defining a data structure like this? Is this an interesting problem to even attempt? There's no it's pointless. I'm not going to know what to bet in time period t as a function of omega because I don't know what's going to happen. So omega against the set of uh, things that but let's move to time one. Um, and the game now is if it's heads, I am. Um, yeah, if it's, if it's heads uh, in time two, you. Uh, well, actually, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define a really stupid problem here. If it's been heads in time one, in time two, before, uh, and you bet, you're going to get double your money, otherwise you're... It's a really silly problem. But, um, in time period one now, I can express my bet as a function of omega one, which is the history I've observed up to period one. Is this clear or did I lose completely? So what would be if... if what could be the possible values of omega one? The history I've observed up to time period one. It has to be their heads or tails. And what would be the um, optimal reaction for heads? It's bet, so that's the rule of the game I can find. And x one of tails is no bet. The essence here is not to understand the example which is pretty stupid in terms of what the game looks like, but the notation. Making decisions on the basis of what I've observed up to time t is a meaningful way to describe a decision-making problem under uncertainty. 
making decisions on the basis of what is going to happen until the end of time is meaningless because I don't know at time when I'm deciding what's going to happen until the end of time. That's why here the x's are functions of omega superscript t and not functions of omega. Implicitly, this data structure, when you define it, for example, in NAMPL, think of programming this in NAMPL, you will have to explicitly define a data structure of the history up to time t. It will be a baron, and uh, you will have to have a set of, uh, of possible combinations of observations up to time t, and this data structure will be indexed over time. Okay. And so this is the setup. One other last thing I want to say about this slide is, <clears throat> and by the way, I mean here, the function, yeah, yeah, the dependence of the capital T matrix on omega superscript T is again the, the same, comes from the same thing that this data if what I've observed up to time t is the same for two different scenarios, the data can't be different because the way I've experienced reality up to time t is the same. Um, okay, so that's, that's where the dependence on capital T is coming from. Um, okay. There's another thing I wanted to mention here, as far as this example is concerned. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I think, I think it's clear to you. I'm just going to forget it. Okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, okay, the last thing I want to talk about here is objective function. Uh, in the objective function, note that we have nested uh, minimizations, expectations. So these two are alternating. The way to think of that is that, um, for example, in the last period, given what I've observed up to the last period, I'm making, I'm doing my best for the last period. Then the metric of performance I've used, I'm using is the average uh, cost impact of that. And here we will introduce the notion of a value function the way we've seen it already, but um, for multiple time stages. So we have this uh, nested um, minimization within an expectation. Basically, that's the other thing to note about this objective function, which means I'm doing my best what I have observed so far. Okay, I think I um, said enough about that slide. So, like I said earlier, xt um, omega up to time t is the state of the system up to that time period. And when you're thinking in terms of modeling a problem, whatever you decide x to be, it's up to you to a certain extent what x will be but you have to make sure it contains all the information you need to make a decision in time period t. And I will show you now a couple of examples where it's, it's kind of, it can be a bit non-trivial, what, determining what the state vector is. So I have the usual alarm sign here. Okay, and here's one of my usual uh, favorite examples, which um, comes out really lousy PNG format, but um, okay, this is a scenario. I thought these lines are kind of worn out. Okay, so when I described it in the first version of the, the notes, Matthew told me to add some uh, figures to make this more uh, um, easy to understand, and then I remembered that I had seen in a conference a presentation by Mario Pereira's group from PSR, which Who's showing the sequence of events on a scenario tree? So, this is a bad version of that. And what we have here is the hydrothermal scheduling problem. It's a classical decision making problem under multiple time stages. The problem is the following, and then after I prepared the slides, I also found that another 
really famous guy in our area, Andy Silbot. When he introduces the problem, he uses this really simple graphic to help people get the idea. You have hydro uh, resources, which are water dams, and you have uh, conventional generators that you can use for satisfying a demand in a certain region. Um, either you use the conventional generators, they burn fuel and you provide power, or you release water from the hydro dams, they provide power, or both. In Brazil, this is a big deal because of the Amazon. They have tons of dams, so it's a very complex problem of deciding how much water to keep in each of them and um, how, how to serve demand going through the year. Here's the reason why it's complex. When, you, when the year begins, you don't know how much rain you're going to get for the rest of the year. Now, if you get rain uh, in the first month, then um, your uh, water dams fill up and you can, at each time stage here, you can be using both of these resources to be satisfying demand. Which one do you think is worse to use? Which one do you not want to use? Yeah. The reason being, you burn fuel. The other one is free. Question is, how aggressive do you want to be on the free resource? The bad thing is that if you're too aggressive in the beginning of the year, when there's a lot of uncertainty about how much rain you're going to get, you're going to push the water level down, and if you don't get as much rain as you expected for that year, you're screwed by the end of the year because you have to turn on very expensive generators and occasionally you have to um, curtail demand, which is extremely expensive. The capacity of Brazil is not enough. These, these guys are not enough to serve on their own the full demand of the country. They rely on the water and to satisfy some of the demand. So if they deplete their water levels, they will have to curtail demand. And this happened back in late uh, early 2000s, and that's what basically made Mario's company very famous, is they had rolling blackouts because of a very dry year um, throughout the country, and they turned around to the experts and said, why did this happen, and how can we make sure this will never happen again? And Mario, by that time, had solved the hydrothermal scheduling problem, and that basically when he started up his company and became a multi-millionaire. Um, so... This is basically the sequence of events. Now, on the other hand, okay, so hopefully I made it clear you don't want to be too aggressive with using the water. What's the bad thing about being very careful is that if you're not using any of the water and you're burning fuel as the year goes by, the dams fill up, at some point they're completely full, they start spilling water. In the meantime, you've been burning fuel You've been too conservative, you end up spilling water that's not used for satisfying power, uh, demand. So if you're too conservative, you spill a free resource. You see the trade-off. You could have used that water instead of spilling it in earlier periods to satisfy the demand. So um, that's the setup that I'm trying to illustrate here. You start from a certain state, you decide to use some water and some fuel here. Maybe you get rain, in which case your reservoir is looking better. Um, and then in this uh, first, uh, second stage, maybe you get more rain, and if, if you've been careful, you won't spill any water, and this tank is almost, but not quite full, but you will. Uh, but if you've been too conservative, you're going to spill water here, and that's a cost you could have avoided. On the other hand, in the extreme case where you don't get any um, rain for two consecutive time periods, and you've been too aggressive with your water early on, you might end up curtailing so, the setup is the way I described it over here. Decision. How much water to use, how much thermal generation to use, uncertainty, which is the rainfall, decision, the same, uncertainty, and this repeats over multiple time stages. Okay, now, um, I have a specific numerical example. The reason I've set up this example is because I want us to do the recursions that are shown in the book uh, on a specific example and since the book doesn't have one I've made this one up because the book throws at you the uh, dynamic programming algorithm without really 
giving you an example. And since you told me you haven't done dynamic programming, I wanted you to apply it uh, for a specific uh, instance to see what the value function is, what the state vector is, and so on. Okay, enough said. Three periods. Uh, demanding each period is one unit, whatever. If you want to use the uh, thermal generators, you pay one unit of cost per unit of uh, demand. And you can only produce half a unit of power from the thermal. The cost of hybrid is zero. The cost of Cartesian demand is very high. It's 10 times the cost of uh, conventional generators. Now, this is very important here. The rainfall you get in each period is a uniformly distributed random variable between zero and one, but identically uh, independent from time period to time period. Okay, this is uh, important. So my question to you is, what is, if you were modeling this problem, what would you define as the state vector? Again, the intuitive definition of a state vector, uh, and control theorists make a big deal about what defines a state vector, is from our point of view in this class is, what do I need to know at time t to make a decision for time t? Accept the uncertainty, yeah. because the uncertainty is the, 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 we, we're kind of the uncertainty we observe at time t is a separate piece of data. The way I've described the problem so far. So, what do we need to know for the hydrothermal scheduling problem in words to make a decision in time period t? The quantity of hydrothermal available. Yes. Anything else? <clears throat> Do we care about how much thermal generation we produced in the last period? For example? Not, not really. Not really. I didn't give you any constraint like that. If I had told you that the generators can't run faster than a certain rate, then that becomes an important piece of data that you need to make a decision now. So, um, so correctly, uh, Raphael says the amount of hydro in the uh, dam in period T. Now, the amount of rainfall in period T is not a member of the state vector. Again, the way I've described the whole problem is there is stuff coming in from T minus one and what I observe in T. So there's these two things that are revealed to me uh, when I'm deciding in T. State from previous period and the rainfall now. So the rainfall now is not a the, the, the uncertainty I, I observe now is not a member of the state vector. Okay, now, um, how about this situation here? Same problem as before, but the except for the model I use for the rainfall. It's not a uniform, identically distributed random variable anymore. I have an autoregressive order one model for the rainfall, which means um, period T rainfall is period T minus one rainfall plus noise. What should the state vector be? Is it the same problem or a bit different? It's a different problem. Right. You want me to make a decision now? Well, if this is the model of rainfall, I need to I I need the information that's over here to make the decision. Otherwise, how, how do I even know what shape the rainfall is going to have this month? I, I need a model for that. So if this is the model you're proposing and you want me to make a decision now, you have to also tell me what happened last month. So we add the previous month's rainfall to the state vector. OK, so enough said about state. So how do we solve the problem? The book gives you this recipe here. Um, it says, go to the end of time and solve the last period uh, problem. So the last period problem is 
minimize last period costs subject to input from the second to last time period and you know whatever uncertainty I observe and again and the reason I'm emphasizing that the superscript indicates time is because you're going to see a bunch of superscripts in the next slide which could be confused with raising something to the power of three but it's not that it's time period three so how would you write the last period optimization as a linear program I'm going to propose some names for variables and you can tell me what to write out <coughs> let's call P the thermal production Uh, let's call Q the hydro production. And let's call capital D, ah, let's call L the load shedding. And let's call capital D the demand. And here we're entering territory where I've made up an example so that it's likely that the next slide will have errors. What's the objective function given these uh, decision variables? It was one unit of cost for the thermal, 10 for load shedding, water was free. And the constraints. Now, let me emphasize something. The, the, the setup you want here, this will help you formulate this problem. This is the reason I'm doing it. We're looking at the last period, which is period three, of a decision making problem in three periods. X2 is the state in uh, period 2, which we said is what? It's the level of water in period 2. Um, so this function that we're, this, this optimization problem that we're going to write out has an input W2 the level of water in period two. And it has xi3, which is the amount of rain in uh, period three. So. Side, two, two or three. Now, now it starts becoming three. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I guess we probably need these guys. Is there anything else you think we need? Adrian's model looks a bit more proper. So what I did is I subtracted the rain from the demand, thinking that any rain you get is free, so you immediately send it to serve demand. And then I, I don't know if I'm correct here. Yeah, basically my Q, no, this is wrong. Um, and this matters because it's going to influence the... Okay, 
this is a bit wrong. So let's try and solve it with this model, which looks to be the right one. And so this, yeah, since the Q is the amount of hydro used in the last period, well, it's not, yeah, it's, it's the same linear program, really. It's just that I'm defining Q as the water I used before it rained. Effectively, if I mean, if we write Q prime equals Q plus uh, psi three, then it's the same linear program. So I think that this value function holds as I'm going to compute it in the next couple of slides. Uh, but the proper, yeah, really the proper way to write this out is like this, not like that. And I will change that in the slides. Okay, so, uh, but le let's see what the optimal solution looks like, and it should be the same for both approaches. So, what are the three cases to consider in terms of what can happen? What happens if it rains? Well, actually, this case is kind of useless because of the way I define. Oh no 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 uh, no! This is this is fine. I think. So so what happens if the amount of rain I get in the last period plus the amount of water in the reservoirs is bigger than the demand? We, we said low? If it's lower. If the amount of rain plus the water in the reservoirs from period two is bigger than the demand. Mm -hmm. Come again? Mm -hmm. So no cost. Zero. That's the case here. It could be the case that water that I have already plus rain um, is not enough to meet the demand, but if I also use my generator, then I can cover the full demand. That condition is this one over here. So the W2 plus Xi3 is less than the full demand, but the, if, I add the, if I also use my generator, which has a capacity of a half unit, I can meet the full demand. In that case, I use a bit my thermal generators. Okay, so how much do I use them? I use them by this amount here. Demand left over after rain, minus water, whatever water I had, which because it's the last period, this is a crucial thing about looking at the last period. The last period is the simplest one because you do a greedy policy there. You use up all your water and you're, you're left with nothing in the reservoir and then you use up a bit of the, the thermal uh, that you have. So this is the cost you pay. But it might also be the case that the amount of rainfall is very little. The level of water in my dams was uh, very low. And then even when I used the half unit of my thermal, I still couldn't satisfy all of my demand. In which case, the cost looks like this. So I use up all my thermal, which costs a half, and then 10 times um, the remaining demand minus the water, minus, uh, minus the rainfall, minus the water I already had. Okay, this is the greedy solution of the last stage um, decision uh, making problem. Now, the value function of this is the expectation uh, of this Q function over the Xi3. Okay, so the book, and note the, the, the notation here. Value function in period three as a function of the uh, state in period two. Okay, it's Vt plus one of Xt. This will matter a lot when we're gonna do the L-shaped method for, for uh, uh, 
um, for solving this problem. So the definition of this thing is the expectation over last period possible outcomes of the last period Q function, which we defined as a function of x being the uncertainty of t plus 1. Okay, so for our specific... Okay, so that's how we define V3 of x2. And then the way you solve this problem entirely until period 1 is you move back. You send this back to period 2. This is your Q function for the last period. You average it, average it out to see what your costs are as a function of x2, of the water you left at your reservoirs in period 2. So this value function tells you what is the, it, assuming you do things optimally from time t plus 1 until the end of time, what I'm going to expect as average cost if you leave me with xt at period uh, t. Okay, that you can just plug it into the optimization problem at period t and solve this as a single period optimization problem. That's the magic of dynamic programming. You use this backwards argument to solve single period optimization problems. But you have to define this notion of a value function. The best you can do after this period is over and until the end of time, given you left the system at state xt. So that has to enter your, your objective function. Is this intuitive? I know you haven't done dynamic programming before, but is this, does it make sense intuitively? What I, the intuition is what I do now, I pay a cost now, plus some kind of average cost until the end of time. That way, you know, if my optimization problem now was only a function of the cost I pay now, then I would have had a very greedy uh, policy for making actions now. So we define this value function that maps how I leave the system at the end of the period and how that much that's going to cost for me on average until the end of time. That's something that's well defined mathematically and we can exploit this function to build up single period uh, problems. That's the intuition. Okay, um, so I do this for every time period until I go back all the way to the beginning of time and the solution to the problem, the average cost of this optimization problem is just the objective function of the first period. And here I'm missing a V2 of x1, I'll fix that. Clear? For our example, this is the computation you made. Uh, value function period 3 of state at period 2 is the average of the two functions. So we saw three possible things that can happen. Um, how did I come up with uh, this here? For example, if the water level is greater than or equal to 1, yeah, so intuitively that's what's going on. Mathematically what's going on is that all of these probabilities are uh, 0. Okay, we've written up the Q function. So we, we can play now with these expressions mathematically. But intuitively, exactly what you're saying. <clears throat> if water levels are between half and one, then how did I come up with this <coughs> expression here? Do we care about the first term? It doesn't matter, even if it's positive, because it's multiplied by zero cost. The cost, again, um, so what I've done here, mathematically, is I've applied this definition, okay? So I, to apply this definition, I go back to the Q function and take its expectation over the Xi. So the expectation moves in here now. And the probability stays uh, out, outside of that uh, range of outcomes. So, this is just applying basically the definition of the, the, the value function. So, 
how do you how do you come up with uh, this here? Is this a positive quantity for these water levels? If W two is greater than or equal to a half, then this probability has to be zero because psi is uniformly distributed between zero. So the only term we need to really care about is this guy over here. So W two, and again, this is the whole reason I'm introducing this example is to get used to thinking here of W two as a parameter for this problem. Okay. I assign a certain value to W2, it's something bigger than a half. So what is the left hand side here? Something negative. Is that clear? Suppose W2 is 0.6. Okay. How much is if, if W2 is 0 0.6, how much is this thing? Probability of psi 3 in these intervals. 0.4. Basically, what you did is you took this to zero and said, what's the mass from zero to one minus W2? It's a uniform distribution. It's one minus W2. OK. That's the term here. How about <clears throat> this expectation of rainfall conditional on the fact that rainfall is between minus 0.1 and 0.4? I know it was uniform to start with, but now I'm conditioning on the fact that it's between minus 0.1 and 0.4. So what's the average level of rainfall? Two point? And point four. Zero point? Be careful. But I know to start with uh, that it's it's a uniform in zero one. So how how much do you want to say? Who says zero point two five? Right. So, again, think of W2 as just a, a number here. It's a parameter. It's just a number that you plug in. I tell you, psi 3 is greater than or equal to minus 0 0.01 and less than or equal to 0.4. But I know originally that psi 3 is uniform 0, 1. So basically, this is what's really going on. I'm conditioning on this event. The condition value of rainfall on this event is the midpoint. Point. The midpoint here is 1 minus W2 divided by 2. And I have. <coughs> so I'll screw it up. Because then this doesn't go away. Okay, yeah, I, I knew there was going to be a problem coming up. Anyway, um, I'll fix this, but you get an expression here which looks like uh, 1 minus W2 times um, half plus W2 over 2, I think. Just W2 over 2 because the halves go away, right? And I want to say that this would be okay if it were not concave. Mm. Anyway, um, this is exactly what I was afraid was going to happen when I was saying an example that I would discover in real time. A mistake. Um, let's forget this just happened and 
Or, or we can just try and resolve it now, but in principle, the, the value function, we're going to see this theorem in a bit, needs to be a convex function of the state. Um, so here, right here, we have a problem. Maybe it's the cost. Half minus. Ah, okay. So half minus one is minus a half plus psi three plus w. No, but that's what it was. Minus a half plus psi three plus w. Um, I will have to rework the example. Something went wrong somewhere, but mathematically, sorry for that. This uh, thing here should be a convex function of uh, W2 of this thing. Why is that useful computation? This is the way to solve the problem. So what are we looking at in period T? What are we looking at in period T for computing QT? It's a convex optimization problem. It's not linear necessarily, but it's a convex optimization problem. It's good news, okay? Um, now, in particular, if the set of random outcomes is finite, it's a linear program, okay? That's um, that's something that we can exploit heavily. Basically by replicating the L-shape method. Uh, because the value function, we can show even in a multi-stage stochastic program, is a piecewise linear function of xt. So we're going to do exactly the same trick that we did with the L-shaped algorithm for the two-stage uh, optimization. Now, uh, to show this, uh, so there's this theorem in the book. Um, it defines kt as a set of feasible decisions for stage t. Uh, vt plus 1, again, note that for value function period, t plus 1 is a function of xt. It defined as this thing here. And xi catalogs are the support, so the setup which uh, xi has a mass. Um, so it says if the, um, first of all, these value functions are convex functions of x. Also, these sets of um, feasible regions are polyhedral. And if the set of outcomes of xi, xi is finite, then these value sorry, these are convex in general, but if the set of outcomes is finite, then these value functions are polyhedral. They are piecewise uh, affine functions of xi. To prove that, you just go with induction. It's, um, um, you go at the last time step, time period, and you know that Q is a convex function of x h one minus one. Why do you know this? For the Q function in the end, what is the optimization problem? What, what is the definition of Q h of x h minus one? Right, so again, it's this argument that I wrote earlier that f of b being the minimum of this, is, this thing is a convex function of the right hand side. The x h minus 1 enters in the right hand side. Okay, that's why you know it's true for the for the last period. Why can't you apply the same argument for any time period to show Q is convex in a x h x t minus one for any time period? If you remember, this is the definition in general of Q. So why can't you use that same argument for any time period? Here we would like to show that Q is a convex function of x t minus one. 
We showed it's true in the last time period. Can we apply the same idea here? And I've screwed up the notation again. Have I? Uh, oh, you can just... Okay, no, I haven't screwed up the notation, but you can you can apply that same argument. So where is it? Why do you need the induction? Then? Um, somewhere you need to use induction. So okay, so VH is convex because of the average of these. Finite number of realizations of xi implies that VH of x h minus one is a finite sum of polyhedral functions. Um, so here all I'm saying is that the Q capital H, so for a linear program we in fact know that this is a polyhedral function of being not just convex but specifically polyhedral. So QH is polyhedral, so the finite sum of QH is, is piecewise linear also. So VH, uh, V capital H polyhedral, but somehow we need to use uh, induction. Convexity polyhedral property follows by induction. Maybe the error is. Sorry, I, I will need to come back to you about why you were using induction in this proof. I thought it was because of the value function, but the value function is a function of xt, not xt minus. Anyway, I'll, I'll get back to you on that because I'm sure you will lose, lose your sleep over the weekend. Okay, okay, and we have three minutes left apparently. Um, that sucks, okay. Um, scenario, please. What should we do? Um, I don't have time for scenario trees, so we will see them a lot in the course. So we'll have an opportunity to see these slides again. I'll, I'll add them in future lectures. Let me quickly go to a block separability, which is short. <clears throat> okay, block separability is a, is a specific, so we'll, we just have these two slides and we're done. Block separability is a property of uh, certain stochastic programs where you can dramatically decrease the size of the state vector. Do we really care about how many dimensions the state vector has? Does this dimensionality of the state vector, how many components it has, does it really matter computationally? Do you think? Did it matter for the shift method? It's it's not important. Well, bigger vector means um, larger linear programs that need to be solved. So in general, it does matter. It's practically significant. The size of your state vector matters. On top of that, in multi-stage stochastic programs, this effect amplifies because you get a multiplicative effect. So if we can push the size of the state vector down, it helps a lot. There are problems where that have specific structure called block separable recourse where we can do that. We can split the state vector into stuff that really matters for the future and micromanagement decisions that are unimportant for the evolution of the future. An example of that is the capacity expansion planning problem. How much capacity we add at a certain time period matters for where we're going in the future. The micromanagement decision that we had to make in each time period which was how much fuel to use to satisfy each demand segment. Intuitively, why doesn't the amount of fuel we use today matter for tomorrow? Why what do you do you would you think it matters? In the capacity expansion problem, I know it's hard to remember, but um, 
we were not depleting. We could get the fuel if we paid for it. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't carry over. So that part of the state vector stays behind. It matters for the cost, which shows up here, but it doesn't move into the uh, state vector of the next time period. So that mathematically is captured by the these equality, okay, um, by, by the equality constraints of period T. Big decisions, W decisions matter because the time period T uh, state depends on the previous ones. But uh, the time period T state does not depend on the micromanagement decisions of y2 minus 1. In particular, the structure of the, of the matrix, matrix here, of the T matrix that, sat, that multiplies the x. So remember, x t is defined as wt, important decisions, and unimportant ones, which matter for cost but don't move forward. So the, the way the constraint uh, matrix, the coefficient matrix looks here is RT, WT, 0, 0. That's mathematically block separable uh, structure. You can exploit this. In the capacity expansion planning problem, this can make an enormous difference on how fast the problem solves by only carrying over the part of the state that matters. 